I think it's very appropriate for you to know why the Bible teaches that I could never be a Roman Catholic and you, biblically, should never be a Roman Catholic person. I'd like to start in our study tonight and then review where we've been by going to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. One of our army officers gave me this uh, article out of the U.S. News and World Report that's March 29th. I always think that's interesting. It's tomorrow's, and he gave it to me a week ago. Uh, that's an amazing uh, phenomenon that they can publish stuff into the future, but it's, it's called The Weeping Madonna. And I read this through several times just to share with you um, something that's very current, as current as tomorrow, about where people are in relation to this whole concept of Romanism and the worship of, uh, as, as portrayed there. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to show you verse 3, 4, 13, and 14. And this is the Apostle Paul, and, and he's talking to a group of people he loved deeply. And he's really bearing his heart to them because he had seen them through their birth into Christ in his missionary journeys. He'd seen them grow in Christ. He'd rebuke them. He'd discipline people uh, and committed them to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, seen them come back to Christ. He dealt with their lawsuits. He dealt with their uh, immorality. He dealt with their... Um, terrible gross activity at the Lord's table being drunk and fighting over the food people that were babbling some of them under demonic type influences and, and calling Christ accursed and I mean, just terrible stuff and now he's kind of coming to the end of two great letters and, and much ministry to them and much as a father would uh, talk to that son or daughter going out maybe just before they get married maybe when they're going out to that uh, first big trip in the military or whatever that that time when you kind of pass on your, your father's heart. And this is what he says. He says, I wish that you would, verse 1, bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. And again, the whole metaphor of the church, the bride of Christ, and, and all that. But look at verse 3. But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. What I'd like to warn you about tonight in my last time talking about the Roman church is that something happened. Something tragic happened from this era in the Bible. Let me just rehearse for you just a thumbnail sketch of where the church was when the apostles were here. The church was conquering. It was conquering the world, not through social activism, but through personal renewal and regeneration and, and supernatural life. And when people got saved back then, they renounced the world. They left it behind. They burnt their magic books. They left their immoralities. They left their occultic ways. They renounced paganism and they turned in newness to Christ and they suffered for it. And things were really amazing. The church was flourishing. People were being saved every day. People were living holy lives. People were seeing the power of God. And the apostles were ministering and they were writing letters and the churches were growing. And yes, they had problems and they had questions. But it was a very simple, as he says in verse 3, the simplicity and purity of Christ. What was the simplicity? Well, Paul gave his testimony. He says, I delivered unto you, that's 1 Corinthians 15, first of all, that which I also heard, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. In other words, the whole gospel was based on the Scripture. Period. And it was simple. You made a choice between Jesus Christ or eternal damnation in hell. It was a very simple choice, and many people chose both. It was a simple gospel. Well, verse 4, If one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear with this beautifully? You see, as a father, he's starting to chide them. 
He's saying, you're not on your guard, and I'm, I'm passing off the scene. This is 56. He's going to be around till maybe 62, maybe 64. He's uh, 56 AD. He's got maybe eight more years of ministry, but he knew he was getting near the end. And he says, what if someone preaches you another Jesus? Not a different, an, not um, heteros, but, but one who is another of the same kind. In other words, he's not talking about uh, Guru Rajneesh so-and-so from India. He's not talking about Bhagwan uh, Salami. He's talking about someone that claims to be the biblical Jesus. He says, and if someone presents you a Jesus that doesn't line up with the Bible, and someone presents to you a Holy Spirit that doesn't measure up to the Bible, and someone presents to you a gospel that you have not accepted that's not simple, he said, you might go along with it. And you know, it happened. Because what happened with the church was the apostles passed off the scene, and their disciples like Ignatius and Polycarp, who knew the apostles personally and who had been led to Christ by them, they powerfully led the church into the second century, the 100s A.D. But something happened, and pretty soon the church started giving in to a little formalism here and a little sacramentalism there and a little bit of baptismal regeneration over here and a little bit of uh, hierarchical stuff and, and letting people rise up to be ruling over the church that Peter warned against. And by the time we get to the 4th century, the 300s AD, the Roman church was the church of the Roman Empire. It was still the church of Jesus Christ built on the apostles and prophets, but it had become religio licita, the officially recognized church of the empire. Well, the emperors had to do something about that in 313 AD at the Milvian Bridge when Constantine beat his contender for the throne. He saw a vision. Now, watch out for people that see visions. Jeremiah 23 says there, there are a bunch of prophets running around that preach a vision that's not from the Lord and things haven't changed much, they're still around. Usually they involve your pocketbook. You know, they always have a vision for your money. But he had a vision, and he saw a big flaming red cross on a blue background, and he saw the words, in hoc signe vince. Isn't that interesting? It was in Latin, and, and he understood Latin. And he saw that, and Constantine conquered at the Milvian Bridge by painting red crosses on all the shields of his warriors. Ah, red cross. Christ, Christianity. And so he said, that must be what happened. So he became a Christian, in quotes. Well, what did he do with the state church? They had the pantheon of Hadrian. They had all the priests of Dagon and the priests of Marduk and the priests of Phoenicia, Astarte and, and Baal. And what do you do with Isis and Horus and all that gang from Egypt? And what do you do with Semiramis and Tammuz? What would you do with all the, the deities coming in from Persia, Mithras? And he said, well, I have an idea. It's religion. Let's just all work together. Well, the church didn't like that too much, but they accommodated the influx of paganism. Now, up until that time, the church was just what you see in the New Testament. They read the Bible. They broke bread. They baptized people after they were saved. They didn't have anything to do with baptizing infants. They didn't have anything to do with prayers for the dead. They didn't have anything to do with Mass. Mass doesn't come around for 12 centuries. It was just simple house churches, breaking bread, fellowshipping, baptizing people, confessing Christ, preaching the Bible, praying, and loving Jesus Christ. But here came all these religious priests of a pantheon of religions in 313 A.D. And they brought in their censers, that's incense burners, and they brought in their robes, and they brought in all their candles, and they brought in all of their various beads that the pagans used. Remember Christ said in chapter 6 of Matthew, don't pray mindless, rote prayers, repeating the same thing endlessly over and over again, thinking God's going to hear you and bless you because of that. That's the first few verses of chapter 6. Well, here come the pagans with their prayer beads. Here they came with their cutting their hair in certain places, bald spots on top of their heads, which was a part of paganism. Here they came with their feast to the sun god. Here they came with their feast to the love god. They came with their feast of worshiping the death and resurrection in 40 days of Baal. And they were confronted with, what do we do with all this stuff? And he said, well, that one's close to Christmas. We'll put that one by Christmas. That one's close to Easter. We'll put that by Easter. That one's over here. We'll put that there. 
and gradually paganism seeped in. And the apostles, Peter, Paul, John, the early church, the simplicity, verse 3, that was in Christ started to get complex. And it started evolving. And tradition became as powerful as scripture. And then it was more powerful than scripture. And the church got to the point that by the 12th century A.D., they were so confused that they believed they had to crucify Christ over again every day. And that has persisted for centuries. And so when I talk about the Roman Catholic Church, I'm talking about the church today that believes all of that syncretism. Do you know what syncretism is? Religious syncretion is when you blend together the best of everything. Some New Age ideas, a couple of Hindu ideas, get a couple of Jewish ideas and throw in a little sprinkling of Christianity and you don't want to offend anybody. And that's why the Rhode Island National Council of Churches, which buys into that, sends out letters to clergy like they did to me that says, if you ever pray in public, don't offend people by mentioning Jesus Christ. He is very offensive. Talk about the supreme power, the deity that they can worship at the Masonic Lodge or at AA or down at the Baha'i Temple, but don't bring up Jesus Christ. That's offensive. Do you know why? Because the preaching of the cross is to those that perish foolishness, and it offends them. It says in 1 Corinthians 1. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the only power of God unto salvation. But that's been muddled over the years. <laughs>